I use another thought, but I'm going to continue with the way this thing ended last night. Never planned it that way. Just in, in prayer today, God gave it to me. I wrote it down. I'm going to share it with you now. Is judgment coming? I said judgment is coming. I said it's already begun. Now I'm going to, I, I'm going to say to this congregation, as a, as a state of, of question, do we really believe it's coming? Do we really believe that the judgment of God has already begun in America? And it's, it, it's on the way. It's on the horizon. And that it is possible that we will see that before we ever get raptured out of here. That God could judge America before He ever brought His wrath to the whole world. He could deal with us. He could bring it to America. Now I'm going to answer that question for you. You don't have to answer it. I'm going to answer it. Do we really believe that it, it is going to happen? I'm going to tell you, no. By all means, no. I'm going to tell you, the majority of you sitting in this congregation tonight, that you do not really believe that judgment is coming. I'll prove it to you from the message and through the message and from the Word of God that most of you sitting here tonight, though you heard it and you, you read the newspapers and you've been involved in things, you do not really believe that God's judgment is going to come to America. You do not really believe that it could happen in your lifetime. You don't really believe it could happen before the rapture takes place. For if we did, then there would be some different things taking place around the McClinney Church of God. Now turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. I'm going to read several verses of Scripture there. Then we're going to go to the book of Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. First let us read from Genesis chapter 18. If you have your Bible... I'd sure like for you, if you would please, to follow me in, in what I'm saying. I don't want you to misquote, misunderstand, or misinterpret. I want you to see it for yourself. If I, if I can't get you to see what God's saying, then all is lost. I pray those of you that are, have unplugged your televisions, that God is helping you to get over your nervous spells, and you're able to, to uh, calm down now, and things are back to normal with you again. You're finding all kind of time to pray, all kind of time to study the Word of God now because that the uh, sewer pipe is not being flow, uh, flowing through your living room. I do appreciate the young people that's been coming and praying each night in the prayer room. It is making a difference in the service, young people. And I, 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 I'm grateful to you for that and those that are coming here in the sanctuary and praying. Do we really believe it? I want to use for a subtitle. I don't know. Maybe someday the Lord will just give me a message on this. But it's a subtitle. I will use it in this message. Do we really believe it? The answer is no. But I want to use for a subtitle too that thought is just six short. Just six short. In verse number 16 if you read the entire chapter, and I don't, I don't have time for that, but in verse number 1, the Lord appears to Abraham. He's going to talk to him. Now in verse 16, it is the Lord and two angels. They appear as men. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, and he will command his children and his household after him. Thank God that's in there. He didn't just tell them what to do. He showed them how to do it. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. The Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abram, Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? 
brit venture, there be fifty righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. For it ventured there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? He said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. Spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. He said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall be thirty, or, or shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. For adventure, ten shall be found there. He said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. The Lord went his way as soon as he had left communion with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. Now in chapter 19, we'll read verse 12 through 14. And the men said unto the lots, I notice in chapter 18, the Lord stayed there with Abraham and talked with him. The two angels that appeared as men went on into Sodom. Now they come into Lot's house. The men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons, thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. We will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord the Lord hath sent us to destroy it Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law which married his daughters and said up get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city but he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law Verse 23, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. He overthrew those cities and all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the cities which grew up upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him she became a pillar of salt. Did they really believe it? And Abraham got, got up early in the morning, the place where he stood before the Lord. Did Abraham really believe it? He looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, Smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Did Abraham really believe it? Jonah chapter 3, verse number 4 and verse number 5. Did Nineveh really believe it? But Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. Did Nineveh really believe it? So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe from him 
covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes, caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout or through Nineveh by the degree of the king, and his noble saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way, from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent, turn away from his fierce anger, that we perish not? Let the Lord add his blessings unto his word. Do we really believe it? I've heard things before and read things, and so have you, that your attitude was, upon hearing or reading or studying about it for some time, you would say, I just don't believe that. I just don't believe that's the truth. Or I just don't believe that ever happened. Or I just don't believe that anybody could ever do that. Now, I, I know that I don't have to buy an inquiry magazine. Just standing in a checkout line, they put them right there. And sometimes some of the most ridiculous stories I've ever read or heard of is right there on the front page. And automatically, I just form this opinion. I don't believe that. I, I don't even have to read the article. I just don't believe that. I have formed that same opinion about a lot of the news that we hear today through the newspaper and also through the television news work. And there are some things that they twist them or they apply them from a liberal standpoint that they might desensitize or change or form the minds of the American society. So therefore there are times that I just don't believe what they say and what they portray in the news broadcasting stations. There are some preachers that I've heard that I just don't believe some of the things that they say. Well, with some of them, I don't have, and it don't take me long, or I don't have very much problem determining that because they don't preach what thus saith God. So therefore, I just don't believe what they say. Do I really believe the Bible tonight? Ask yourself that. Do you really believe that this is the unadulterated Word of God? Do you really believe that men of old, inspired by the power of the Holy Ghost, penned those words, and it's God's Word from front to back, Old Testament, New Testament, that we got to live by the whole Word of God? Do you really believe that? Do you know there's a lot of preachers today, a lot of ministries and denominations that no longer believe that the whole Word of God from Genesis to Revelation is inspired by God, that some of the books there were just men's opinions or something that they thought that ought to be in there and it was put in to the King James Version and they don't take it as the Word of God. So therefore, they just don't believe it's all the Bible. Do you really believe that sin's going to pay off someday? Well, sinners don't believe that. Do you believe that you can't do wrong and get by? But yet there's a lot of people in the church don't believe that. Do you believe tonight that God Himself is the one that flooded this earth with water and killed the old as well as the suckling? Do you believe that God done that? Do you believe that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire? God did. Do you believe that God Himself is the one that killed Ananias? and Sapphira that was members of the first Pentecostal church because they lied? Do you really believe that? And I'm going to tell you the most part of the Pentecostal church today don't believe that. Why? Because there's a lot of lying that goes on in the Pentecostal church today. They just don't believe that God will ever do that to them. Do you really believe the rapture is near? The most part of the church don't because they... Live as though He's not coming. Do you believe the wrath of God is going to follow after the rapture takes place upon this whole earth? 
Is America headed for destruction? Most people don't believe so. Did God really kill Korah and his family and company because they began to rebel against designated authority of the Old Testament church? Do you believe that God's the one that opened the earth up and killed the Israelites? Well, most people in the Pentecostal church today don't believe that. Because they rebel, they think it's against the preacher, the pastor, evangelist. But in essence, they're rebelling against God when truth is preached. And it's not my theology, but it's what thus saith God. And they don't believe that it's going to cost them anything, and they also readily rebel against the truth of God. Do you really, really believe that God killed all of Israel? In the wilderness, excluding two of them, and then the third Moses taking him up on the mountain. But the rest of them, having eaten the manna and drink from the rock, the water that God had provided, yet God killed Israel in the wilderness. You really believe that? Do you really believe that God is going to judge you personally? you really believe that God knows your thoughts as you sit there this very moment? Do you really believe that God knows why those that did not come tonight, He knows the real reason they're not in this sanctuary? And their frivolous excuse, if it may be that way, it will not stand before God. There is very little reason, as a matter of fact, not to be in the house of God. But somehow, we've just gotten away from the fact of the and the theory that God is going to judge me personally. That we just go along happy-go-lucky, do what we want to, just like the Catholics will run to the church on Sunday and say some little prayer and God wipes the slate clean and, and then we start all over that week and live just like we want to live. And then the next Sunday rolls around, we say a few words to God and as though God just so happy-go-lucky and so thrilled just to take it all away so we can live like we want to the rest of the time. Do we really believe it? Ah, uh, we say we do. We sing it. We sung about it tonight. We don't really believe it. Don't get puffed up at me. You stay with me. I'll prove it to you. We don't really believe. Oh, yes, we believe some things. And there's some things we put it in the category of maybe. And there's other things we just flat out say, no, I do not believe that. I don't believe it's going to take a separated life to make it to heaven. I don't believe it's going to take praying always to make it. There's people here tonight. You have formed that kind of opinion. I don't believe it's going to take what Mason's been preaching here this week. We just don't believe that God will do it. And here's the proof. By the way that we live and by the way that we don't live by the things that we do and by the things that we don't do. The church today, that world that you live in, it is not grieved over the condition of the city. It is not grieved over the fact that the sins of McClenny has grown by leaps and bounds. We have learned to tolerate them and accept them as though it's got to be that way. We're not grieved over the condition that the U.S. is in or the world is in. We really don't care that millions are going to hell. We don't really care. You may not like me saying these things, but we don't really care. The love for the church has been replaced by the love for self. The church used to love one another. And they was concerned about one another. And they esteemed others more highly than themselves. They was interested in the welfare of the other person. That love for the church. And you can't love Jesus without loving the church. They're inseparable. But that love for the church has been replaced for love 
for pleasure. Entertainment. Again, I'll prove it to you. We don't really grieve over the sins of this community. We don't really care that millions are going to hell. Our love for the church has been replaced. And the proof is by the way we live. And by the way that we don't live. You don't need to look to your left or your right. Was God really going to destroy Sodom when He stepped over the bounds of glory? The Lord come, He come in the form of a man, and He brought with Him two angels, and they took on the form of men, and they came to this earth for two pre- purposes and two reasons. His first purpose in coming was to bless. He came first to the man Abraham and his wife Sarah. A man 99 years of age and his wife 89. He came to tell them and remind them what he told them 24 years ago. It's going to happen. 99 plus 89 equals one son. Because that son Isaac was born unto them. But when he got through blessing Abraham and Sarah, though Sarah heard the report and she laughed about it, now the Lord begins to go towards Sodom. And Abraham's walking along with him. And the Lord says, Shall I hide this thing from Abraham? He is a faithful servant of mine. The world's going to be blessed because of this faithful man. And I'm going to destroy Sodom. And he goes outside of where Abraham lives. And there he stops. And Abraham and the Lord is standing there together. The Lord tells him about what he's going to do. And he sends the two angels on. And they go on into Sodom. There Abraham begins to talk to the Lord. And I want you to see the questions that he asks the Lord. Will you kill the righteous with the wicked? Are you going to destroy the good with the bad here? He said, Lord, will you spare the place? You can see that. Will you spare the place? If you can find 50 righteous there, will you spare the place? He could have just said, God, will you just get Lot and his wife out of there and so be it with the rest of that crowd? But he didn't do that. He said, Lord, if you can find 50 righteous people there, would you spare the city of Sodom? And he carries it on further and he gets real personal. He's very sincere and he's earnest about what he said. Why? He believed what the Lord said. He knew when that Lord, the Lord stood there that day and told him, Sodom is going to be destroyed by fire and brimstone. He believed it. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? He said, Lord, you're the judge of the whole earth. And just this is just one little part of the earth. You'll judge the whole earth. But we're dealing with just one place here or one plot of property. The Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, within the city, and I will spare all the place for their sakes. If I can just find 50 righteous people there, I'll spare that whole city for the sake of 50 people. I don't really know why, but Abraham's not satisfied with 50. He takes five off of it. He's still not satisfied. He goes to 40. The Lord always responds, I will do it. I will do it. If there's 30, I will spare them. 
How about 20? I will spare them. Lord, if there's 10 righteous people in that city, will you spare them? I'll spare all the place if there's just 10 righteous people there. The Lord goes away. Abraham goes back to his tent. I'm sure his heart is heavy. He knows that God meant what he said. The two angels have arrived into Sodom. Notice in verse 12, the angels tell Lot, Get out of this city. Get all your family members, all your kin folks. Get everything you have and get out of this city. Why? Because the Lord has sent us here to destroy the city. Verse 14. So Lot went out of that house. He believed it. Lot went over to his sons-in-law's houses. And he said to them, I can just in my mind's eye, I can see him as he frams and beats on the door with urgency. Up! Get out of here! The Lord's going to destroy this place. And their response is, I don't believe it. I don't believe that. I don't believe God's going to do what you're saying. Now the reason of that probably was this. Because of Mr. Lot himself. Because of how he had lived. He had not been outspoken against their sins. He had tolerated some things and he had sit and closed his eyes at some things. It was Lot, mind you, moved them into Sodom. And now he's trying to get them to believe what he's got to say, but they won't do it. There are some of you sitting here tonight you're in that same condition. The reason you have no influence with your neighbors or kin folks or some on your job is because how you live. You're up and down. You'll tell the same joke they tell. And you're like a roller coaster. And they watch your lifestyle. And so now you tell them the Lord's coming back. They don't believe you. Why? Because you don't live like He's coming back. And you'll never affect them. You can scream at God all you want to. There's going to be some husbands and some wives and children and parents that's going to go to hell because of that loved one that they had that would not stand for the truth of God. Verse 15. The morning came. It was the day before that the Lord stood there on that mountain and talked to Abraham. It was that night that the angels come to Lot's house. He believed it. And sons-in-laws and, and daughters wouldn't believe it. But now the morning has come. The angels take Lot and his wife and two daughters that were still at home. Takes them by the hand and almost has to drag them out of the city. I, I really can't comprehend that. Maybe because that Lot knew that he had some loved ones didn't respond. I just don't know. They go out of the city. Remember. Abraham prayed or talked to God and said, God, or Lord, if there's ten righteous people in that city, will you spare them? I'll do it. Now it's time to count. They've come to the outskirts of the city. And there's such a sad reality that strikes. There's nobody else there waiting. Nobody else. 
Nobody else believed. There stands just four people. No family. No servants waiting. If Abraham had only known, to say four. If he had have said four, when they stood that day on the outskirts of that city, and those angels took account, one, two, three, four, there would have come no fire from heaven. None. Because God is a God of His Word. We just don't believe it. No, wait just a little while now. Wait just a minute. Abraham, you were seven short. Because Lot's wife just turned and looked back. You were seven short. Abraham believed what the Lord had told him the day before. For in verse 27, Abraham got up early in the morning and he went to the very same place that he had talked with the Lord. For the Lord had told him, if there's ten there, there'll be no fire. But when he looked, a sigh of sorrow goes through his heart. I don't know. Maybe he fell to his knees. Begin to wring his hands and maybe begin to scream. Maybe begin to say, I was short. I was short. Why didn't I say five? Why didn't I say one? You see, Abraham did not know that Lot had gotten out. He didn't know it. As far as he was concerned, Lot had perished there. He looked in the whole sky over Sodom and Gomorrah and the plains was like the smoke from a furnace. Abraham believed it. But Sodom didn't believe it. Why was Sodom destroyed? Why? Why was Sodom destroyed? Chapter 18, verse 20. The cry of Sodom is great. God told Abraham that. The cry of that city is great. What are you saying? He's simply stating to to Lot, there's a lot of suffering and pain going on in that city, and I've got to stop it. Why don't you just heal them? I can't do it that way. It's sin. I must bring judgment upon them. I'm a just God. So his means of stopping the suffering and the pain there to bring judgment upon him. Second, he said to Abraham, their sin is very grievous. No doubt he was speaking about there the homosexuality that that city had entered into for the most part of it. It was a grievous thing to God. That wasn't the only reason that God destroyed Sodom. He he destroyed Sodom because ten righteous were not found. Lot failed to produce ten righteous people. He failed to produce in his own family, ten righteous people that believe the report of God. He didn't do it. For some of you sitting in this house tonight is likewise with your own children. They don't even believe the Lord's coming because they see you. They don't believe the judgment is coming because they see you. How that you live. If you really believe, then you act upon it. To believe is to act. The Lord told Abraham, 
And Abraham believed it. And he acted upon it. began to pray. He began to talk to God about doing something about it. The angels come to Lot. They tell him it's going to go up in fire. He believes it. He goes and tells his kin folks. They don't believe it. Lot has at least two daughters, two son-in-laws, and they have at least. They said sons-in-laws and daughters. They take at least two of those things. They did more. He even talked about sons. But all he got out was two daughters that was really hard. That's all. Nobody else believed it. He was the man that walked with a man called Abraham. The blessings and the benefits of God flowed on Abraham. Lot had a family who just didn't believe. Where did Lot fail? Where was his failures? His first mistake is when he left Abraham. His second mistake was when he pitched his tent towards Sodom. His third mistake was when he moved into the city of Sodom. His fourth mistake was when he tolerated the evil of Sodom for the social and the material advantages of that city. That's the reason that Lot lived there for what he could get out of them. What he could benefit from that wicked society. This Pentecostal church is doing likewise. Lot loved personal gain more than he hated the sins and wickedness of Sodom. He loved what he could get out of that city more than he loved or hated what they were doing. He was in a place where he could have done something about it. He sat at the gate in a place of a car. But for the sake of losing some kind of income, or causing some kind of problem, or being cast out of the city if he stood up against homosexuality. So he said nothing about it. The showdown's coming for the preachers. Coming. Brother Thornton, it's coming for you, sir. You're going to look at the day, and if you say anything about homosexuality is a sin, you're going to stand in judgment. On this earth. But Sodom. Accommodated Lot. They gave him what he wanted. They just didn't deal with their sins. There's some of you sitting right here tonight. You're getting out of this world what you can. You dare not say anything about. Your sins. We have church members today that will condone the wrong of some for personal benefit. They'll condone it. It's okay. That's my child. It ain't so bad now. That's my family. I don't see where it's so terrible now because that's little Susie or that's little Johnny now. So it don't look so bad now. So we condone it. We tolerate it. We permit it. Because we don't want hubby or wife to get upset because we take a stand against the wrong in the family. We got some wimpy back husbands today. They're afraid of that, that little wife of theirs because of what she's going to say. They won't stand up and take their position in that home. And saying, this will not be here. I will not buy that. I will not stand for that. I will stand against it. So for the sake of keeping harmony with them, they'll say nothing.
church members today. So and so is doing it, so they say it must not be so bad. My Sunday school teacher does it. I don't see where it's bad. Well, the music, musicians, they're, they're doing it. Why? I don't see where it's so bad. We've got members in the holiness in the Pentecostal church world today grow and sell tobacco. Just like Lot. If I can get some proceeds from it, material gain, it's not so bad. We got people right here in in and around this area in Duval County. They claim to be Pentecostal, holiness people, but they work at the breweries. church members today that help to make and to distribute unchristian things. I mean help to distribute it. I know of one sister that she had gotten saved as in Jacksonville in the Bible. She worked at a pizza hut. She got saved that night. The next day the phone rang. Asked her, I gotta know what to do. I work at the Pizza Hut, and I have to tote the pitchers of beer to them and set them on the table. I believe it's right to drink it. What am I going to do? I'm going to go back. Oh, I wouldn't have told them that. Not me. I wouldn't have said that. That's the reason. It's in the message in there. There's a lot of things we say and we won't do ourselves, but we're sure helping to distribute it. We're sure helping to make it or to get it out there for them. If it's sin for them to do it, it's sin for us to help them to get it. God needed somebody to go to Nineveh. God don't take any pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. He don't hoop and ha and shout and carry on when he has to destroy wicked people. He does it. It hurts him. When he has to damn somebody to a place of eternal separation from him, Nineveh was on the road to destruction. God needed somebody to tell him. He called Jonah. I ain't going. I'm not going to tell him. And he goes in the very opposite direction. And in the known world then, at the point he was going to Tarsus was the furthest point that he could go by ship. And it was to Spain. And so he takes off going the different, the opposite way that God said to go. And he's gone now and he's down below the deck asleep. For three days in the belly of a fish got him ready to go. He's ready to tell what God's got to say. God told him to go once. He didn't go. When that fish put him on the shore, he was ready then. God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh. That's just exactly what I had on my mind. Yes, sir. I've been thinking about that for three days now. Yes, sir. I mean, I'm glad you said that. I've been wanting to get there all this time. Just, just, I'm not even going to spend much time here talking. I'm going to Nineveh to do some preaching. And Mr. Jonah got to Nineveh. Three days journey, he done it, he done it in one. Tell me he wasn't in a hurry. That man was in a hurry. Why? He believed God meant what he said. That God's going to bring judgment to that country and somebody's got to go tell him about it. Jonah delivers the message. The Bible said, you folks have got 40 days. He tells them that. 40 days and this thing's over. I mean, here's a man, they never saw him before. He's in a pagan country. He tells them, 40 days is all you got. 
they believe you. One message, they believe you. It didn't have to have a sign. It didn't have to have some super duper preacher come by and prophesy. They didn't have to have somebody come by and call them out. They didn't have to have somebody lay hands on them and they'll fall on the floor. They didn't have to have any of that. Just a man said, judgment's coming in 40 days and you're finished. The Bible said, so the people of Nineveh believed God. It didn't say Jonah. It said it, they believed God. They knew that's Jonah doing the talking. He's just a mouthpiece from the other world. And the church has lost that reality. You ain't telling me what to do. I'll do what I get good and ready. If God's got anything to say, He'll say it to me. Cora had the same kind of attitude. I'm just as old as Aaron is. You can be just as holy as Aaron, but I can tell you something, mister. You're not the high priest, and God didn't put you in that position. And when you rebel against delegated authority, your goose is cooked. Because he opened up the earth and swallowed him alive. They heard them as they went down into the earth alive, screaming, Screaming out to God because they rebelled against God. I can tell you, Cor believes God now. I can tell you, Cor believes what Moses said that day that you can't do it, Cora. God put Aaron there and you better submit to him. He believes it now. But it's too late. Men have believed it. They believed it so much they proclaimed the fast. They got down in sackcloth. Everybody did, from the least to the eldest. The king believed it when the word got to him because he made a decree. that ain't nobody going to eat or feed their beasts for a drink. The scripture stated that everybody cried mightily unto God. And the king said in that decree, I want everybody to turn from their evil and violence. And the reason is so that we do not have to perish. Nineveh believed it. Because they believed it, God spared them. A whole nation was spared. Because one preacher preached one message. It was not a message of mercy. It was not a message of prosperity. It was not a message of rapture. It was a message, judgment is coming. America, judgment is coming. McClenny, judgment is coming. Yeah, maybe, no. Every one of us is one of those three categories. I'm going to tell you where the most of us are tonight. No. That's where the most of us are. No. I do not believe it. The church today is like Jonah. She is asleep. She's gone to sleep. Persecution didn't put her, put her to sleep. It made her grow and live. But ease, prosperity, good things took the church. As Jonah was asleep on that boat, as exactly for the church of McClendon is tonight, the most part is asleep. Something had to awaken that man. God didn't have choice two or three. Jonah was the man. God doesn't have plan B or C, the church. Is the vehicle 
and it's going to work for you. You sitting there tonight, you're the one. It's going to take something to awaken us. What did it take for Jonah? It took God sending a storm. And it got us attention. The storm did. That old boat began to reel and rock. Tossed to and fro. And Jonah got awake. God has spoken to McClaney. Through the wind. Through the water. Through drought. But greatest of all, He has spoken to you from this Word. Right here. There's some that they don't believe it. Well, they chose not even to participate in this service tonight by coming. Has God really spoken to us? Is judgment really coming? We don't believe it. We do not believe it. We do not believe it. Proof by the way we live and by the way we don't live. We don't believe it. We've kitted ourselves. We powdered ourselves. We've camouflaged ourselves for so long till now we believe it. That we're okay. I'm telling you, McClaney, judgment is coming. It's coming. It's going to come. It has already begun. You're one day closer. And what you were yesterday. But you don't believe it. You don't believe it. The proof is these alders right here. The alders prove we do not believe it. Right there. There's so few time, little time spent there that tells God we don't believe it. We don't believe it. How much time did you spend in prayer today? Don't answer me. Did one tear roll down your face because you was grieved for the sins of the clinic? Just one. Did it bother you any at all today to know that while you were living, multitudes were going to hell while you were living? Did it bother you at all? We just don't believe it. We just don't believe it, God. It ain't going to happen to us. It won't happen to us, God. We don't believe it. Stand with me, please. Here's the altar. Do we really believe it?